afternoon and good evening, depending on where you're viewing this live stream. My name is Mike Yaffe, and I am the Vice President of the Middle East and Africa Center at the United States Institute of Peace. And we're delighted to welcome all of you virtually for this event. I want to extend a warm welcome back to His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Iraq, Dr. Faoud Hussein, and Her Excellency, the Minister of Migration and Displacement, Ms. Evan Farouk Jabrou. Both are part of the delegation of Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa Akademi, who is visiting Washington this week. Minister Hussein and Minister Jabrou are both are both no strangers to USIP. We had the pleasure of hosting Dr. Hussein back in 2014 for a public event at USIP and several roundtables. And Minister Jabrou, is a great, it is great to host you as one of USIP's esteemed civil society partners for the network of Iraqi facilitators and who is now leading such an important public portfolio. We are honored to have both of you with us today and to share your insights on priorities of the new Iraqi government and your vision for peace and stability in Iraq. For those of you in the audience who are new to USIP, welcome. USIP was founded over 35 years ago on the premise that peace is practical, peace is possible, and peace is vital for US national security interests. We work every day to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflicts in some of the most complex and conflict-afflicted regions in the world, from the Sahel and the Horn of Africa to the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. We do this by linking policy and analysis, research and training, and by working with partners on the ground. One of our priority countries is Iraq. The Institute has been engaged in Iraq uninterrupted since 2003. USIP and its Iraqi partners are helping to forge agreements between local communities to reduce communal tensions, prevent violence, and support the safe and voluntary return for displaced Iraqis in areas such as Tikrit after the Spiker massacre, Awija, and Tal Afr. To do this, we work with community leaders, society leaders, and local representatives, in addition to the wider engagement with the, with the government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government. Our work on the ground supports religious and ethnic minority communities as they recover from the devastation left behind by ISIS. Today, we're working in Nineveh province to support these communities as they seek to heal and to facilitate the safe and voluntary return home of the hundreds of thousands who have been displaced. USIP is also expanding its communal dialogue and analytic work to other parts of the country, such as Ambar and the Basra provinces. Another of USIP's key function is to inform policy by connecting our local work and the data analysis and by convening conversations such as this one today, involving US and Iraqi officials, lawmakers, and practitioners. From a peace building perspective, we aim to inform stabilization efforts and promote, and promote social cohesion. As our long tenure in Iraq testifies, the Institute is committed to supporting Iraq and its people as they chart a course for adorable and lasting peace. After months of widespread demonstrations and political uncertainty, Iraq has now a new prime minister and government who have the opportunity to set a new path for positive change. The prime minister and his delegation's presence here in Washington for a second round of the US-Iraqi strategic dialogue offers a chance to deepen bilateral relations and advance mutual interests and stability in Iraq. Minister Hussein and Minister Jabru, as new Iraqi government, as the new Iraqi government embarks on a mission to improve peace, stability, security, and governance in a difficult environment, I hope that you know that you can you can continue to count on the U.S. Institute of Peace as a partner in this effort. After Foreign Minister Hussein's remarks today. I'll moderate a discussion with him before we move to a conversation with Minister Jabro that will be moderated by USIP's Director of Middle East Programs, Sarhan Hamasaid. We invite you, the audience, to take part in this event 
by asking a question through the Q&A box under the live stream on the USIP event page or the live stream on Facebook. You can also engage with us and each other on Twitter with the hashtag Iraq Minister USIP. So with that, I am delighted to introduce Foreign Minister Hussein. Prior to his appointment in June as Foreign Minister, Dr. Hussein served as the Minister of Finance under Prime Minister Abdul Mahdi from 2018 to 2020. He held other positions in the government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government, including serving as Chief of Staff to the former President of Iraqi Kurdistan region, Masoud Barzani. Dr. Hussein has been, a leading, has been leading very important and challenging portfolios, which put him front and center in many of Iraq's key issues and efforts. He is joining us after a productive day of strategic dialogue sessions yesterday, which he and Secretary Pompeo led. He was also with the Prime Minister today in meetings with President Trump, so we are excited to hear from him about the outcome of these meetings and the overall visit. Minister Hussein, it is a pleasure to host you again at this USIP event. Over to you. Minister, I'm afraid you have to unmute. I forgot that. I'm sorry about that. No so, thank you very much, Michael, for having me here. And thank you, Sir Hang, for organizing this uh, event. And uh, thanks to USIP for uh, each time when I'm here in, in Washington, uh, D.C., they are inviting me. And uh, it is unfortunate. Uh, now we can, uh, we are obliged to organize this event in a different way. However, it is important to, to meet you and to meet many other friends. Uh, everybody is welcome and uh, I'm glad uh, to communicate with you all. Um, perhaps the first question which can be raised why we are here this time um, and why this delegation. Uh, in fact, um, the Prime Minister received an invitation to be in Washington and to meet uh, President Trump. And this morning we were in the White House and we had a very good discussion. But we are also here because we um, started the second round of the dialogue, uh, um, strategic dialogue between Baghdad and Washington. And uh, there is a huge delegation from um, uh, representative of all ministries from Iraq who participated in this dialogue and the dialogue started yesterday. So we, what do we want to get? What the, what is our, our, our target with this visit? Of course, um, the, um, it has to do with uh, reforming, reshaping, restarting the relationship between United States and Iraqi government. Why well, are we talking about restarting, reforming, reshaping the relationship? Because in fact, in the, uh, in the relation with the previous government uh, under the leadership of Adel Abdel Mahdi, the prime minister, and I was uh, deputy prime minister in that government, um, there was, uh, mm, I mean, the relation between Washington and Baghdad um, suffered from some, uh, let's say, problems. And uh, there was ups and downs in this relation. And Adil Abdel Mahdi has been invited or tried to be here four times, but it was unfortunate he couldn't uh, get uh, the appointment. So, um, and Mm, it went um, worse, actually. So we are here to repair this damage. Uh, because for Iraq, uh, the contacts and the link with Washington is uh, important. 
is important from economic point of view. It is important from strategical point of view, and that's why we are talking, uh, in fact, about strategical dialogue. It is important from security point of view, and uh, it is important, as I said, from economic and uh, financial point of view. But uh, why Iraq is important at this stage for the United States government? I think we have seen when Iraq was under attack uh, and ISIS occupied one third of the territory of uh, Iraq and ISIS established uh, the so-called Islamic State. ISIS was not a threat only for Iraq and for Syria and not for the region, not only. ISIS was in reality a threat for all of us, uh, for Middle Eastern countries, for European countries, for international community. So leaving Iraq as such in a weak position uh, is dangerous. And Iraq is also important for the United States uh, because uh, the United States has got a strategical interest in, in, in the region. And the United States has got many friends. Uh, many friends in the Gulf countries and Iraq is not is on the border with these countries. So when Iraq will be threatened, it will be also a threat to many friends of the United States. Besides that, if we go back to the history, recent history, we fought together, United States Army and the Iraqi forces, the Iraqi military and the Iraqi Peshmerga forces and security forces, all we fought together to, um, against uh, ISIS and ISIS terrorists. And still, there are part of the organizations of ISIS uh, active around Kirkuk, around in Ambar, around Mosul, but also in Syria. So we fought together and we, our interest, mutual interest is there. And so it is important for the United States also to have this relationship with, with Iraq. Um, I am glad to say that yesterday the meeting was excellent and we reached with the American side good understanding. In fact, the discussion were about uh, different topics, different subjects. So we dealt with the economic and investment issue, oil and energy in general, oil and electricity was part of the discussion. And we, we signed various memorandum of understanding uh, in this field, but we discussed also education relationship and cultural relationship, uh, as well as uh, issues related to health and fighting uh, uh, corona disease. But part of the discussion had also to do with the security. How can we reshape, re, re, uh, reform our relation on, on, on this field? I'm glad to say that we reached understanding yesterday and this morning also in the meeting in the White House. It was an excellent meeting and uh, both sides, they agree that it is important for both sides to continue this uh, relations. And, uh, and I think in the uh, near future, we will see the results of this visit. In short, this is why we are here and uh, what we have achieved since uh, two, three days. And uh, I think uh, I would like to be at your service uh, if there is any question or uh, remarks. Uh, I would like to hear it from you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Hussein. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for joining us as well in the middle of what is a trying time with regard to the coronavirus. We hope next time we can host you back at the U.S. Institute of Peace building itself. Thank you. Um,
Before we take uh, some questions from the audience, I would like to ask you a few questions just to get the conversation rolling. Um, so first, I wanted to uh, focus on your meetings today at the White House. Um, it's my understanding that uh, this was the third time you have met President Trump since uh, he has come to office. Um, so this, it was not new for you. Um, but I, I'm curious to know more about what you had hoped to get out of your meeting with President Trump today and, uh, and more about the results. If you can dig a little deeper in terms of outcomes and what does it mean for the overall U.S.-Iraq relationship going forward? Yes, uh, Michael, it is, it is true that uh, this is the third time that I'm, uh, I had the chance to meet President Trump and to be part of delegation and having discussion with him. Uh, what we have achieved today is uh, Pres President Trump, in fact, emphasized uh, what we had achieved yesterday in the negotiation or dialogue between both sides. Uh, because, uh, in fact, yesterday we touched upon uh, various issues which has to do with the, the, the relation between both countries. As I mentioned, um, President Trump, uh, as I mentioned in the, the previously, I said, we discussed uh, economic items, investment, oil issue, energy issue, uh, electricity, uh, how the uh, American company can help us. Uh, and also we discussed security matters. Today, uh, President Trump emphasized about these things and uh, and we discuss these matters, uh, uh, of course, on, on, on different level. The vice president was there and uh, many other uh, cabinet uh, members were there. And uh, he had different questions about the situation in, in, in Iraq, in the region. Uh, and the prime minister, my prime minister, uh, was very happy with this meeting because uh, we came here to to have a clear relationship. Uh, as I said, uh, there were some clouds uh, 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 recently in the last few months since last year uh, and misunderstanding between both sides. So we were able to clear the way and to put it uh, on the right path. And one of the issues which has been discussed in depth had to do with how are we going from now on build our security relations and how are we going to fight ISIS and um, also to train, uh, which kind of training, how are we going to train the Iraqi forces. These were the questions which has been raised as well as questions uh, about the role of American companies uh, in various fields uh, in Iraq. And we are glad that uh, there were uh, various memorandum of understanding which has been signed with uh, big American companies and we expect them to be back in Iraq again. So this was the achievements that we reached during our discussion this morning in the White House. And, and focusing on the strategic dialogue itself, um, to use your own words, you used an alliteration of objectives here that you wanted to uh, restart, reform, reset, and repair uh, the relationships between Iraq and, and the United States. Um, and the strategic uh, dialogue uh, seems like that has been part of that. Could you tell us uh, how you see the strategic dialogue shaping up towards the future um, and as it helps to uh, achieve those various objectives, as you say? You see, when we are talking about strategic dialogue, that means a process. Actually. We build a process. We started um, a month ago uh, and now we 
put it in different framework, but this process will continue. And when we chose topics, that means on each subject, we are going to discuss. Now we discuss the main issues and the priority on this field. But uh, uh, the next meetings we are going to, uh, to, to discuss other subjects related to the same topic. Uh, I think the important one was uh, to make it clear for every, every, every body that the relationship with Washington is not only limited to security matters, is wider. And that's why we started, if you look to the communique, uh, the statement, the joint statement, you see that we started from, let's say, other issues. So we started from economy, oil, uh, gas, electricity, uh, education, health. And these are the important uh, 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 points. Uh, and these are important matters for Iraqi society. There is lack of service or, or difficulties in providing services. Uh, we have got problem with the electricity. Uh, we need oil companies, American oil companies to invest more to help us in this field. And healthcare, we have got problem. And also for the future to build, to invest in, uh, in Iraqis themselves we established this uh, uh, contact with the American universities. Uh, so there are various fields in uh, uh, which will push the relationship between Washington and Baghdad indeed to a strategic level because it will not be only limited to, to security. And uh, I'm glad we, we agreed about all these points. So we are looking forward to implement what we have achieved now here in Washington. Thank you, thank you. And, you know, in your opening remarks and just now in your answer to these questions, you talked about a number of challenges that the new Iraqi government faces, uh, be it economic uh, security or political reform. Um, and you listed out some of these issues in, in more detail, but. I'm wondering if you can provide us what you see as the top priorities for the new government in dealing with these issues, and then how do you see moving ahead in trying to address them? Michael, um, the most important um, matter for every society has to do with security. If security will not be guaranteed, um, then it will be difficult to invite investors it will be difficult to protect the life of the people. It will be difficult to protect uh, economic sector. It will be difficult to do something else. So security is one of the priority. And in fact, Iraq was under threat since uh, after 2003. In the first year, uh, it went well. But after a short time, first sectarian fight and then Al-Qaeda and then ISIS um, were created huge problem for Iraqi society and uh, security was very weak. And as a result, uh, the various governments didn't have the chance to build or rebuild the country, to build or rebuild the economy, to build or rebuild the infrastructure. So without security, you cannot build other sectors. So the priority is still there, uh, which has to do with security. But the question is, is the security situation so bad comparing, for example, with three, four years ago when ISIS was controlling many areas in Iraq? The answer is uh, no. I mean, comparing with the past, the security is, is quite better. But we must be realistic. ISIS organizations, they are still here and there. Besides the ISIS activities, we have got different threats in the society. Some of them has to do with tribal. Some of them has to do with other uh, groups. And so all these things uh, create um, an unstable situation. So the priority is still in the first place security. 
The second priority is to rebuild the economy. The rebuilding economy and having security, it goes together. Without having good economic life, of course, that will be, it makes it easier for terrorist groups to mobilize young people. So rebuilding the economy and creating more chances for, for young people uh, to find jobs, uh, this is uh, the most important priority for this government. Great, and thank you for that. And another part, and much related to security, is um, Iraq's relations with its neighbors. And I know that Iraq has a delicate, delicate balancing act that it performs in maintaining good regional relations in a very fraught geopolitical landscape. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about what that means with regard to maintaining Iraqi independence and sovereignty as a, as a priority. And it's specifically um, related to Iran. Um, I understand that uh, you recently visited Iran with the prime minister. And I wonder if you can give us some insights about what were the outcomes from that visit and particularly with regard to maintaining Iraqi sovereignty and also trade as well. Um, one of the problem that Iraq has related to its own security has to do with the neighboring countries. Uh, in fact, our policy is to have good relations with uh, all neighboring countries of Iraq. And since we uh, started this job, we uh, talked about and started to talk about having balancing uh, relations with all neighboring countries or create this balance. Why are we talking about balancing that? because we want to make it clear first we are not going to have relation with one neighbor to be against the other or we are not going to prepare one neighbor uh, and ignoring the other one we want to have equal uh, to deal with them equally but of course on the basis of mutual interest with, with each of these neighbors and we have got huge interest in both sides. We can create um, huge chances for the people of these countries together and to live in peace. But um, it is unfortunate that some neighboring countries are intervening in our internal affairs. And some of them, they are attacking us uh, by military means. And of course, this is not acceptable. Uh, we want to have good relation, but we must respect each other and not intervening in the internal affairs of each other. As for the visit to Iran, uh, it is true that uh, I was part of the delegation of uh, the Prime Minister uh, in recent visit to Tehran. And the message was clear. We want to deal with Iran as a state. We are an independent state. And we ask them also to, to deal with us, to treat us as such. Uh, um, you see, the important thing at the end for the Iraqis is to establish the decision process. The process of making decisions must be established in Iran. And to take the decision must be in the hand of the Iraqis. When I'm talking about making decisions, I am not, I'm unrealistic. Of course, there are some decisions which are interlinked with others, but uh, Iraqis must decide about their future. Iraqi must decide about their security. Iraqis must decide about their government. Iraqi must decide about their policy, foreign policy or, or internal policy. This is an Iraqi matter. The neighboring country must understand that. We are trying to make it clear for them that this is not acceptable. If this intervenience will continue by others, including some neighboring countries, uh, then there will be an unstable Iraq an unstable Iraq, it will create huge problem, not only for the Iraqis, but also for the region. 
We have seen it. When ISIS controlled one third of the country, it was not an, only an Iraqi problem. It became a regional problem, but also an international problem. So we need to work together to help each other. And we need to have dialogue. As we started uh, a strategical dialogue with the United States, we are ready to start a strategical dialogue with neighboring countries so that we can solve our problems together. But it will be on equal foot. Iraq is an, an independent country, just like others. And I understand as well that there were trade discussions um, during your visit uh, to Tehran and that uh, Iran had uh, talked of a tremendous increase of expansion of trade with Iraq. Can you talk a little more about what that would look like and any and how that would how you view that kind of expansion on regarding um, Iraqi sovereignty? Um, you see the trade relation between Iraq and Iran, but also between Turkey and Iraq. It's all in the interest of the both countries. The balance of trade is in the interest of Iran and uh, Iraq and uh, Turkey. Um, Iran and they were exporting uh, for $12 billion each year to Iraq, exporting agricultural products and their own um, products which has been produced inside Iraq. But four of uh, these billions has to do with the fact that we are buying, I mean, the Iraqis. We are buying gas and electricity from Iran. Uh, we are buying about uh, 1,200 megawatt electricity from Iran. And Iranians are providing gas to three main uh, power stations in, in Iraq. So uh, that's about, I mean, translating what they are selling to us into money, that's about $4 billion. So in total, uh, uh, the trade relationship between Iran and, and Iraq is about $12 billion. But because of the uh, Corona disease, uh, the border for a while, I think for two, three months has been closed. And I think that has affected the trade, the trade relationship. And it's not comparable now with, uh, let's say with a year ago, uh, but still we are importing electricity and gas from Iran. Thank you. So I'm gonna now turn to some of the questions we're getting from the audience and I'll start with uh, Turkey, which you actually uh, have raised here already. And um, and I wanted to ask you about the relationship between Iraq and Turkey in particular, especially in light of the recent military operations um, that Turkey has in Northern Iraq, uh, noting as well that uh, two Iraqi military officers were recently killed by a Turkish drone. Um, so I'm wondering, um, in light of uh, how complicated the relationship is between Iraq and Turkey in terms of its security and economics, if you can kind of give us a sense of where you see this, the relationship with Turkey going um, in the near term and areas specifically where you have agreements and disagreements with Turkey. Correct. Um, you see in the first place, we are condemning these attacks, military attacks inside Iraq, and condemning these attacks by killing uh, officers uh, belonging to the Iraqi military forces. Uh, in the second place, we always ask for dialogue to, to reach, um, uh, let's say, an understanding with Turkey how to deal with the problems. I'm not denying that Turkey doesn't have a problem. I know PKK forces are still in Iraq and PKK forces uh, uh, in principle uh, 
they are against uh, Turkish. Uh, they are fighting against Turkish army. But this is not new. As you know, PKK has, established, has been established in 1979, and then they started the armed struggle in 1984. And I have the feeling that many people inside Iraq and inside Iraqi Kurdistan became the victim of this conflict. Our constitution, Iraqi constitution, um, is not allowing any group, any foreign group, to attack any neighboring country from Iraqi soil. We are committed to our constitution. So from one side, we are committed to our constitution and uh, it is not allowed for these groups, including PKK, to attack Turkey from Iraqi soil. But on the other hand, we need to have normal relation with Turkey. Turkey is our neighbor and is a powerful neighbor and we want to have good relation. But to solve the problem inside Iraq, uh, this is not the solution. And Turkish army is fighting PKK since, as I said, since 1984, and it has not been solved. Uh, we don't want to be victim of this fight. Uh, on the other hand, we are ready to open the dialogue with Turkey so that uh, to manage this crisis. I'm not talking about solving the crisis because it is not in our hand, but uh, to manage these crises. Uh, violence is not the only way. Uh, as I said, uh, it is important to have dialogue. So we start the dialogue, strategical dialogue here in Washington, but we need also to have an open dialogue with both countries, especially um, with all neighboring countries, but especially with Turkey and, and, uh, and Iran. Thank you. Um, earlier, you, you talked a bit about um, the youth in Iraq, and we actually have two questions um, from the audience regarding the youth, and um, including from an Iraqi citizen who asked, um, how, can, how can we be sure that the upcoming opportunities, especially in education and jobs, will go to benefit Iraqi citizens rather than the politicians and their relatives in Iraq? I think uh, politician and relative of politician, they are also Iraqi. So uh, they have also the right to live there, to have jobs. But uh, if there will be, um, let's say, uh, if there will be justice, then it's okay. But if, if the families and uh, of the politician will be preferred, then, then that's bad. But we have got real problems inside Iraq. You see, this country has been destroyed by wars, internal wars and external wars. Uh, believe me, this, the problem that we have, part of it has to do with period after 2003, but part of it has to do with the period before 2003. You see, Iraq was in a war with, with Iran for eight years, from 1980 until 1981, 88. And then Iraq invaded Kuwait. And then um, uh, an alliance of many countries attacked Iran in 1991. And then there was an uprising inside Iraq. I mean, all these things led to destroy the infrastructure. And when I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm not talking only about military infrastructure, education infrastructure, health infrastructure, economic infrastructure has been all destroyed. And then there was an embargo against Iraq from 1991 until 2003. This destroyed also the culture. Uh, the main problem inside Iraq, I think, not only destroying the economic and, and material infrastructure, but also the cultural infrastructure has been destroyed. The values has been destroyed. So because of all these wars and embargo, in fact, many Iraqis, they were happy that they would reach their freedom and there would be a democratic system after 2003. But after a short time, there were internal fight and then Al-Qaeda and then external and then uh, ISIS. It is since, to be honest, since 
12, um, 17, 18, that there isn't any war uh, in, in Iraq or Iraq in war with others. So for about half a century, for about half a century, Iraq was in a war either with itself or with others. So this led to a huge, huge problem. Everything has been destroyed. And after the change in 2003, expectation went, went high. And Iraq is depending heavily on oil income. No other sectors has been built. Other sectors has been destroyed. Agriculture sector has been destroyed completely. Tourism sector is not there. You can have tourism, religious tourism, but, but still has not been developed. And um, private sector has not been developed. So you have got all the oil sector. So in Iraq, we are talking about uh, market economy. But in fact, we have got only one sector to depend on, and that is oil. And oil is in the hands of the government. So it is not so easy because of security. Once again, I'm coming back to security. Because of security situation to build a normal life. Now we are starting to, to follow this path. Uh, we hope that this security situation inside Iraq will help us so that we can build the economy in a different way. We can rebuild the agriculture sector. When we will rebuild the agriculture sector, it will be easier to have uh, chances for jobs. Otherwise, I see every day young people, demonstration, demonstration of young people, all they are asking the government to find for them job. The government job, in fact, is to create chances for job, not to open job, because we cannot, we cannot uh, all the time uh, create, uh, all the time have everybody uh, in, in, as an employee of the government. Imagine, in 2003, there were about 600,000 employees of Iraqi government. This is 2003. Do you know now we have got more than 4 million people as employees of the uh, Iraqi government? Do you know we have got about 3 million or more retired people uh, getting salaries from Iraqi government? In fact, a uh, huge amount of the income that we receive from oil, uh, I am talking about oil income, is going to salaries. So uh, it is not a healthy economy. We need security so that we can build a healthy economy and healthy economy can be built if we can rebuild agriculture sector, if we will deal with uh, tourist sector in different way, and even if we deal with oil sector in different way. Um, oil must not stay in the hands of the government. Uh, companies must play an important role. But for all these things, for all these issues, we need security. The, until uh, September last year, there were many oil companies, including, uh, including uh, American companies. But in October and November and later on, many companies, they left Iraq because of an insecure situation. So when the security is not there, people are leaving. Not only the foreigners are leaving, even the rich Iraqis are leaving. Those who have got uh, capital, they are not going to invest their capital inside Iraq. They are going to take it away. So this is a disaster for Iraq. We need, at the end, to create better security. And part of it has to do with the Iraqi government, but plus part, of it, part of it, to be honest, has to do with also with neighboring countries. They must help us to build our security. Otherwise, um, I don't know what, which kind of future Iraq will have. Thank you. Um, so uh, we see some questions related to security. So this is a, a good segue from your last remark, uh, particularly with regard to ISIS. And um, it's been said that, um, that ISIS fighters have been traveling across the border into Iraq from Syria. Um, and the questions are related to how secure is that border? Um, how do you, do, where do you see 
the potential for US-Iraqi cooperation with regard to that, and also the question of whether or not Russia has been offering to help uh, secure Iraq as well. Where do we have, um, where is our need first to fight ISIS? I think we have got on the ground people to fight to. So operational actions, uh, we can do it, we can fight ISIS, but we need equipment, we need uh, information. You see, part of the fight against ISIS is not only to have fighters, but to have information about ISIS. We need um, air attacks. Uh, I think on these fields, we can have support and help from the United States. Um, we must not, we must take ISIS uh, seriously. Because I remember in 2014, when ISIS uh, terrorist group arrived in Mosul, they were a small group. But in a short time, uh, they became uh, a big, huge force, and they controlled Mosul, and later on, they controlled other cities. Uh, so we must take this seriously, and I think uh, on this field, we need support and, and, and help from the United States. ISIS is still a threat in the area, not only in Iraq, but also in other countries. And um, have you received um, offers of assistance from other countries, including Russia? During the fight in 2014, there were some support, but not uh, so intensive. Uh, the support which came from the alliance under the leadership of the United States and uh, some neighboring countries. Okay, thank you. We received a question with regarding the relationship between the federal government and the Kurdistan regional government. And the questions have to do with um, what are the outstanding issues uh, between the two governments and how do you see that relationship developing in the going forward? The relation between Kurdistan government and, and uh, the federal government uh, was very bad especially in the last year of the government of Prime Minister Abadi. But uh, it has been repaired during the first period of Prime Minister Adil Abdel Mahdi, and I was a member of that cabinet. And uh, on the basis of the budget, um, I, as a Minister of Finance there, uh, I was able to pay the share of, uh, of KRG because that was their right. Uh, but in April, um, the Prime Minister, then still Adil Abdel Mahdi, decided to stop that. And that created a huge problem between Baghdad and, and, and uh, Erbil. Um, thanks God. Uh, Part of it has been solved recently, a week ago. But I think KRG and federal government needs different kinds of approach. Both uh, sides they need serious discussion. It is not only federal government. I have the feeling that there must be a real mm, good discussion between Kurdish political parties and Iraqi political parties. Because there is an atmosphere among some uh, political parties inside Iraq against KRG. And there is an atmosphere inside Iraqi Kurdistan by some political parties or some elements which is against any approach towards Baghdad. So we need different approach. And I hope that first inside Kurdistan, the Kurdish political parties among, agree among themselves, especially the two main political parties, KDP and PUK. And then they can establish a new approach and establishing uh, ways of having serious dialogues with Iraqi political parties, because at the end, the government of Iraq is depending heavily on the opinion of uh, the political parties. So we need a change in their opinion. And we are approaching election. I think many political parties 
Iraqi political parties need also Kurdish political parties. So the chance is there to have a different discussion before the election and to have a clear common program about, about the future and how to solve the problems between KRG and, and, and uh, Iraqi federal government. Great, thank you. You raised about the issue of elections and I'm curious to know um, more about that. I understand that the prime minister has called for early elections for June 6, 2021. Um, I'm wondering what you need to prepare for early elections and if you see a role for the international community to help with elections. What we need internally is first to finish the, to, um, the last touch on uh, the election law. So we need the parliament to do that and the parliament must do it. Uh, of course, the election commission, commission has got also some, some shortages. shortages. Um, shortages which has to do with the organization, but also financial shortages. This must be solved. And then uh, to decide uh, how we are going to prepare the ground for the election. Uh, so we need a decision from the parliament in the first place. Uh, as for uh, international organizations, I think the last election, uh, which has been uh, people of Iraq were not uh, satisfied about it. Some of them, or majority of the Iraqis, in fact, they didn't vote. Uh, but that was not the problem. The problem was after the election, many political parties, they claimed and that, uh, that, that there was uh, let's say um, um, people were playing with the results of the election. And having international organizations as observers or helping the IHEC, the election committee in Iraq, I think that will help so that people will have trust in the election. We need a kind of building trust in the uh, coming election because if there will be trust in the coming election, there will be um, people will accept the results. And when the results will be accepted, then people will have trust in the future government. And then the relationship between the government and, and the people is important to run the country. If there will not be uh, trust between people and the government, then you cannot do a lot. So we need to build trust. And I think the process of the election, coming election, with having foreigners, with having in, international NGOs and international observers there, but also international organizations which can help the Iraqis to prepare the ground so that it will be a fair election, that will help to have a new government uh, and to create trust between the people and the future. Thank you. Um, we have several questions, but I think we only may have time for one more. And so um, let me ask you this question, which has to do with Iraqi debt. Um, and I know Iraq is going through a tough time as many countries that depend on oil um, in light of the drop in oil prices. But this question is particularly about what is the, uh, how do you view Iraq's debt, particularly to the World Bank, to the United States? Um, how do you see that impacting on Iraq's overall political and economic and social situations? And how does the government plan to handle this debt? The real debt of Iraq is $23 billion to foreign countries foreign institutions. And internally, the Iraqi government borrowed 41 trillion dinar. Perhaps that's about, let's say, 35, 34 billion dollars. So this is the real one. Because some people, they are talking about 120, 160 billion dollars, but that has to do with, with with the numbers which has been used in Saddam. Uh, so this is the real. Uh, I think 
for Iraqi government in Iraqi economy, um, it can it can deal with this. Uh, but first, we need different things. First, we need a different approach as for producing oil and dealing with our oil internally. We need uh, international oil companies, uh, perhaps um, in the future to take steps towards having part of the oil either producing or exporting in the hands of private sector uh, so that we can introduce the concept of private sector to other sectors. Otherwise, if oil will stay in hands of the government, uh, it will create always problem for us. And the economy will depend on oil only, and oil is in the hands of the government. So to pay it back, it is a problem, but it is not a huge problem, to be honest. I think if we will reorganize our economy, reorganize our financial system, and of course, if, uh, I'm talking about reorganizing of all these, but we need still security. If we will have security, we can manage this. Uh, part of it from this that has to do with the World Bank and other financial institutions. But as I said, uh, Iraq can manage this. Financially, um, still the uh, United States is playing an important role uh, because uh, um, Iraq, if uh, the American are supplying Iraq with dollars and we are receiving uh, each period a big amount of dollars. So that's important for the Iraqi financial system and supporting financial system. So we, we uh, it is very important. By, by the way, coming back to the strategical dialogue with, with the United States. So this is an important issue for us because uh, Dollars is coming from from United States and supplying. It is United States who is supplying us with dollars, huge amounts of dollars. So um, the debt issue is an issue, but it is not a very huge one. Well, thank you, thank you. We actually have room for one more question, and this one we just got with uh, regarding armed groups in Iraq. And um, it talks about uh, how there have been attacks on U.S. How, uh, U.S. forces and coalition troops from internal and external armed groups. Um, and the question is, how can Iraq meaningfully deal with such violence and the armed groups that perpetuate it? This is an important question, of course. And uh, first, uh, talking about armed groups, then we must define which groups are they. Um, but uh, anyhow, this government is determined to deal with these groups because either they must be part of the Iraqi forces, and when they will be part of the Iraqi forces, then they are under law, but also under the command of the Prime Minister, because he is the commander of the Iraqi forces. If they will be outside the state, if they are functioning outside the state, then that means they are against the state. And this is a huge problem. This is a big discussion in our society, in, uh, within the political parties, but also in our contact with the outside world. Uh, at the end, I think there will not be place for these uh, groups who are attacking uh, diplomats, attacking embassies, uh, these are functioning outside the state. So with the strengthening the state and strengthening the state, I'm not talking only about security, I'm talking about many things. And then these groups will disappear. But we need first to strengthen the state. Some people inside Iraq, they are talking about the state and not state, non-state. So uh, there are some people functioning outside the state. But uh, uh, at the end, if we will have more stability, better economic life, these groups will disappear. Well, thank you. Thank you, Foreign Minister Hussein. Uh, we thank you for sharing your thoughts and your insights with us today and on the development of the strategic dialogue. We wish you the best with that. And we want to thank you for your continued partnership with USIP 
um, and between USIP and the government of Iraq. We hope that you'll come back and we'll agree to further sessions with USIP in the future, hopefully back in our building at that time. So with that, um, let me turn it over to Sarheng Hamasaid, who will be moderating a discussion with Iraq's Minister of Migration and Displacement, Minister Jabru. So, Sarheng. Uh, thank you, Mike, for moderating, and thank you, Minister Hussein, for your thoughtful insights. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Sarhan Hamasaid. Uh, I'm director uh, of Middle East programs here at USIP. Uh, I have the honor to moderate this segment of the program, uh, which is going to begin by remarks by uh, Minister Ivan uh, Faik Jabro in Arabic, which will be consecutively uh, translated after my framing uh, remarks. After the remarks, uh, we'll move on to a Q&A uh, uh, session with the minister, and we invite you to keep sending in your questions through the Q&A box under the live stream of the USIP, on the USIP website event page, and also the uh, uh, Facebook live stream. So uh, looking at Iraq, obviously the conflict uh, with ISIS has resulted in displacing uh, over 5 million Iraqis. Uh, the positive news is that with the Iraqi and international efforts, about uh, 4.7 million people have returned uh, home or to their home provinces. The sad news is that many of these displaced people return to destroyed homes uh, and destroyed communities. Um, close to 1.4 uh, million people remain displaced, including many from the religious and ethnic minorities. They continue to need uh, urgent humanitarian assistance and other forms of support to ensure stable and peaceful recovery. Uh, more so during the prevailing uh, COVID-19 health crisis, uh, which has significantly complicated the risks uh, faced by vulnerable uh, and displaced um, uh, uh, families, including ethnic and religious minorities, uh, and has further hindered their access to essential services and livelihood opportunities. We at USIP take pride uh, in being part of the ongoing effort uh, to help uh, people go home. We do this through facilitated dialogue uh, that aims to remove barriers to safe and voluntary return. Um, and when people return, that they are able to rebuild their social and economic lives within uh, their own communities, as well as with communities around them. We know that more work lies ahead. and. Uh, uh, there are, there are, that these are very difficult um, uh, uh, to, to achieve, uh, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the so-called ISIS family members and those who are perceived to have affiliation with ISIS, um, uh, which are in tens of thousands of people. To discuss these issues and how the Iraqi government is working to address, we are joined by Minister Ivan Faik Jabro, Minister of Migration and Displacement at the Government of Iraq. Uh, Minister Jabro was uh, confirmed as minister in the Kadhimi government in June of this year. Uh, this was a welcome development given the strong uh, women uh, leader uh, she is and uh, the fact that recent cabinets were criticized for the lack of uh, women ministers. As minister, she is also the head of um, the High Council for Humanitarian Affairs in the government of Iraq, which is an interagency body working uh, on displacement issues uh, and, and related matters. Uh, uh, Minister Jabro is no stranger to USIP. We have had the uh, pleasure of working with her uh, as a member of the uh, network of Iraqi facilitators, but also in her capacity as advisor to the Alliance of Iraqi Minorities. She served as uh, Nineveh government advisor for minority affairs, um, head of the Chaldean Association in Basra, member of Nineveh's um, uh, Consultative uh, Women Council and many more institutions. Uh, so as you can see, she comes to the ministry with a mix of uh, government and civil society roles that exposed her to the issues uh, of the people up close. Um, Minister Jabro, it is a pleasure to host you here at USIP. It was great to see you yesterday. Uh, I'm sorry that we had to do this uh, virtually because of the coronavirus. Uh, welcome and over to you. حقيقة شكرا 
جزيلا انا سعيده جدا بتواجدي معاكم تحيه طيبه لجميع الساده والساده المستمعين واكيد الحضور حقيقه يعني احنا كوزاره الهجره والمهاجرين باعتبارنا يعني الجهه القطاعيه المسؤوله عن دعم واغاثه النازحين حقيقة في كل بداية سنة وخاصة بعد تبوي المنصب كان هناك أعداد الخطة جدا دقيقة مهتمين جدا بملف النازحين وكيفية إعادتهم الطبيعية إلى مناطق سكنهم من خلال أكيد استحصال الموافقات الخاصة من الأمان العامة حقيقة كان كان كثير من المعوقات اللي سببت عدم عودة الكثير من النازحين إلى مناطق سكنهم هو تأخير أقرار الموازنة لعام 2020 حقيقة أدت إلى حال دون تنفيذ كثير من مشاريع الاستقرار في المناطق المحررة وكذلك يعني كان تسببت في أنه أيضا عدم صرف العديد من المبالغ بما يخص منحة المليون ونص اللي هي تصرف للعائدين إلى مناطق سكنهم ولحد الان نعاني من هذه الازمه المزدوجه لا سواء كانت على مستوى مالي على مستوى العراق ككل او على مستوى وزاره الهجره خصيصا وكذلك بما يتعرضه العالم كله بما ما يخص جائحه كورونا. تمام. Thank you very, very much for every, everybody. Uh, so the uh, plan for, of the ministry to support and relieve the ID, IDPs and the returning families. The uh, ministry has a full, uh, a full grasp of what's going on as it, is, as, as it is the responsible ministry for supporting and relieving the IDPs. At the end of each year, a plan is being pre prepared, and that plan is uh, approved by the uh, Com Comsec, and uh, it is to be followed on a weekly basis. Of course, the uh, de de delay in approving the 2020 budget uh, de delayed uh, the, ex the execution of so many uh, stabilization projects in the liberated areas, and it also delayed the uh, Caching of the returning allowances, which is uh, 1.5 million Iraqi dinar for uh, each returning family, uh, uh, around uh, 5,000 families have been uh, included with the, with with this allow allowances, and the rest of the families were not uh, were not included due to the lack of liquid cash at the ministry. حقيقة منذ اليوم الأول اللي تبوأنا المنصب كان لنا من ضمن الخطة اللي بنعمل عليها حتى نساهم في غلق المخيمات وكذلك العودة الطبيعية للنازحين كان لنا عديد من الزيارات الميدانية للمخيمات حقيقة كان الهدف الرئيسي منها أنه اليوم نطمئن الشخوص الموجودة في النازحين الموجودين في المخيمات إنه اليوم هذه الحكومة هي حكومة تختلف عن الحكومات السابقة هي حكومة استثنائية بعيدة عن الأقوال بقدر ما هي اليوم تحب تخدم ويكون لها بصمة فعلية في التغيير لهذا السبب كان لنا تماس مباشر مع النازحين من خلال الاستماع لأغلب المعوقات والتحديات اليوم اللي يعانيها النازح داخل المخيمات فابتدأنا من اليوم يعني من اليوم الأول لتبوء المنصب كان لنا زيارة إلى محافظة الأنبار وغلق تقريبا ما يقارب غلق ودمج 20 مخيم وكذلك كان لنا برنامج مع منظمات دولية بإعادة أكثر من 100 عائلة إلى مناطق سكنها الأصلية ومن ثم توجهنا حقيقة إلى كربلاء أيضا كان لنا عمل في مخيم كربلاء حيث لاحظنا أن هناك من تقريبا ما يقارب 80 عائلة موجودة في المخيم هناك رغبة فقط لخمس أو ست عوائل بالعودة إلى موصل باعتبارهم هم مسلعة فهم الباقين يرغبون بالاندماج والاستقرار في محافظة كربلاء 
So the first plan, since I assume this uh, huge responsibility, is to close all the camps. I had field visits uh, to so many, so many camps, and these visits had the, the, the major purpose of these visits were to assure the IDPs that this government is different. This government is, um, is a government of doings, not sayings. So we listened to the IDPs when we, we visited them. I personally visited the UNBAR and we managed to close 20 camps. In Karbala, in Karbala camp, we had uh, eight, 80 families, but uh, only five or six of them wanted to return to Talafar, so we are still following up on that. بينما ما عدا ما يقارب كانت عائلتين ترغب بالعوده لكن الظروف الماديه كانت تمنعها فبالتالي وزاره الهجره قدمتها الدعم الكافي وبالايام القادمه سنشهد عودتهم الى الموصل لذلك كان لنا زياره جدا مهمه الى محافظه زياله وكان لدينا تقريبا يقارب مخيمين حقيقه كانت مشاكل كثيره في زياله وبالفعل كنا مؤسفين عن سماع المشاكل اللي يواجهوها العوائل الموجودين في المخيمات ما يقارب 500 عائله فقط تعاني من مشاكل عشائريه في منطقه الخلانيه فايضا كان لنا دور بعمل لجنه مصالحه وطنيه تعنى بمحافظ نينوى اكيد باشراف الوزاره وكان لنا ايضا تدخل بطلب من اهالي منطقه خلانيه تدخل احد الشخصيات السياسيه انه يدعم عودتهم وكان لنا اتصال بالشخصيه السياسيه وكانت حقيقه مستجيبه جدا لطلبنا فبالتالي عملنا مع هذه الشخصيه وكذلك محافظ زياله وتم اعاده ما يقارب 2000 شخص الى منطقه المقداديه وجلوله وكذلك الخلانيه توجهنا الى ثم الى سنجار حقيقه وضع سنجار مؤلم جدا باعتبار ان الحكومات السابقه لم تكن لها اي بصمه او اي زياره او اي انجاز ما يخص سنجار فكانت الزياره الاولى الحكوميه كانت من خلالنا بتنفيذ دوله الرئيس بحضور مستشارين لاحظنا وجود للاسف الشديد انقسام كبير بين في البيت اليزيدي باعتبار انه كثير من الجهات الموجوده في سنجار باعتبار انه كل كل مجموعه من الاخوه اليزيديه كانوا يمثلون جهه معينه فبالتالي هناك كان انشقاق كبير وايضا من التحديات الكبيره كانت رئيس الوحده الاداريه غير موجود في داخل سنجار وتم تسمية شخصية أخرى غير رسمية تدير الإدارة في سنجار وكل وكل هذه الأسباب كانت مؤيقة في إعادة أعمار المنطقة وكذلك كان حقيقة وقوف أغلب البرامج الخدمية والمشاريع الخدمية أدت إلى توقفها بسبب عدم وجود رئيس وحدة إدارية في المنطقة in Baghdad, we visited the camp of uh, of Maryam uh, Al Adra. We listened to uh, the IDPs, uh, but only two wanted to uh, come back. So we helped them to process uh, their, uh, their, their 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 efforts to uh, go back in Diala. There have been two camps and these two camps had a lot of problems around 500 families from uh, a place called Khlania. so what we did is that we established a reconciliation com committee in uh, Diala and Nineveh with the help of course of a political figure and the Diala gover governor and we managed to solve their problems as for Sinjar uh, if, maybe, maybe you are aware that the uh, previous uh, governments had no plans for Sinjar. So the prime minister's visit to Sinjar had a great 
effects, but still we have to uh, take into consideration that there is a lot of division um, and uh, um, among the Yazidis, and uh, there was no head of uh, the head of Sinjar was not there at the time of the visit. And um, due to the fact that there, there, there were like two heads of Sinjar, all this delayed the reconstruction as well as the problems with the funds. محافظ النينوى بفتح ملف مكتب ملف التعويضات ليتم العمل فيه من خلال الشخوص اللي موجودة في سنجار ليتم إدارة هذا الملف بشكل جيد وفعلي واستقطاب أغلب الملفات أو استقطاب أكثر المعاملات للعائدين من أجل التسريع في معاملاتهم ليتم إعادة البناء التحتية حقيقة كذلك العام الاقتصادي جدا مهم من الأسباب المهمة بتحول عودة كثير من العوائل كذلك اعتبارها منطقة زراعية تعرض أكثر المشاريع الزراعية إلى الهدم والتخريب وانتثام بسبب أكيد سيطرة داعش وحقيقة أيضا المنشآت أدت إلى أيضا إلى الدمار وفقدان بالتالي فرص العمل قبل توجهنا إلى كوجو التقينا ببعض الأشخاص من أهل كوجو طلبوا منا شخصيا كوزارة بسبب تأخير ملف التعويضات في المنطقة طلبوا من عندنا أنه جهز قرية كوجو بمخيمات أو كرفانات مؤقتة ليتم عودتهم من مخيمات دهوك وسكنهم في في قريتهم بداخل الكرفانات إلى أن يتم إعادة أعماض مناطقهم وحقيقة إحنا في الأيام القادمة راح نقوم بتجهيز منطقة أو قرية كوجو بكل الاحتياجات اللي إحنا نستطيع كوزارة الهجرة أن نقدمها لهم لأن هذا مطلب كان جماعي من أهل كوجو أما ما يخص حقيقة سهل نينا وإحنا لاحظنا كثير من العودة في سهل نينا والمسيحيين بما يقال سبعين لكن هناك مشاكل مجتمعية موجودة بين مكونات نفسها في سهل بين وأيضا بنعمل على تهدئة الوضع وأكيد يعني يو أس آي في على علم ما يجب بمناطق المكونات باعتبار هي من أكثر المنظمات اللي عملت في سهل بين بما يخص التفاوض وحل النزاع وحقيقة لحد الآن إحنا في ديالا وكركوك وسهل لنا ونحتاج دعم كبير من المنظمات الدولية بما يخص تقارب وجهات النظر بما يخص المصالحة المجتمعية فيما بينهم تقبلهم وخاصة أن إحنا في محافظة كركوك يتهمون بعض النازحين الموجودين في المخيمات إنه لهم كان لهم ارتباط داعش لهذا السبب نحتاج إعادة دمجهم مرة أخرى إلى مناطق سكنهم الأصلية مع الأفراد أو مع أصدقائهم وجيرانهم من نفس المنطقة حقيقة هذا كل ما جرى في الفترة الأخيرة وإن كثير من المشاريع سنقوم بها حقيقة من خلال صندوق التنمية الاجتماعي مع وزارة التخطيط اخترنا تقريبا ما يقال ثلاث قرى في سهل نينوى ليتم إعادة عمارها وكذلك بناء البنى التحتية بما يخص طرق أو أو مستشفيات وإلى آخره صراحة إحنا كوزارة الهجرة والمهجرين نعاني كثيرا حاليا من أزمة المالية لكن صراحة يعني في الموازنة السابقة تم ما تم تقريبا إسناد لقانون موازنة 2019 وفق مادة 65 تم استقطاع مبلغ كلش كبير من وزارة الهجرة والمهجرين ما يقارب 445 مليار وتم منحها لمحافظات المناطق المحررة ليتم إعادة أعمار 
المناطق وتقريبا كان محصله محافظه 200 مليار و35 ليتم اعاده كل ما دمره داعش في محافظه نينوى وكل الاقضيه التابعه لمحافظه نينوى وهنا نلاحظ انه سنجار ايضا من ضمن الخطه. كذلك تم صدف 100 مليار الى محافظه صلاح الدين، 125 مليار الى محافظه الانبار، 30 مليار الى محافظه دياله وكانت من حصه كركوك 25 مليار. يعني هذا تم استقطاعها من موازنه وزاره الهجره والمهجرين وتم منحها الى المحافظات لكن للاسف الشديد كان هناك عجز كبير من المحافظين ولم يتم صرف هذه المبالغ بالشكل الصحيح ليتم اعاده اعمار تلك المناطق ما عدا محافظه واحده فقط تم اعمارها وبالتالي تم عوده 95% من مناطق سكناهم الاصليه اللي هي المحافظه شنو؟ ما اتذكر اسمها. اوكي سو فور سنجار سو ماني هاوسز وير ديسترويد سو وي اسكت ذا ذا جفرمنت ذا ريجنال جفرمنت ان نينفا تو استابلش ذا ان اوفيس فور كومبنسيشن in sinjar um, this uh, aimed at expediting the re reimbursement process where families with destroyed houses can apply for compensation and uh, since uh, also sinjar is an agricultural area you can also you, you can also imagine that there was a lot of damage we also went to the village of uh, kojo we listened to the to uh, to the to the inhabitants of that village who who are living now in the camps in the hook so they asked uh, our ministry to provide caravans in their village so that they can re return from the to their land as they are staying now in uh, the hook so they asked for the for caravans to in uh, set up in their village and uh, we will provide that very soon as for Nineveh plain 70 percent of the idps uh, came back so many NGOs are active in Nineveh Plain and they have a great and appreciated role. In uh, Kokuk, um, we have uh, some camps uh, that has uh, a certain problem, which is the ISIS-affiliated fam families. We are working on that, but that uh, takes time. That's all that happened, uh, and we will continue to work through the development uh, development fund to uh, establish uh, and build roads and hospitals. But still, the fact that there is a, a, a problem with liquidity, as uh, you 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 may not know that uh, around. Uh, uh, 445 billion Iraqi dinar from the budget of the Ministry of Immigration were reallocated to the liberated uh, governorates so that so we uh, we think we expect that there will be more rehabilitation for Nineveh got 135 billion Iraqi dinar and Sinjar of course is part of Nina Inuba. We also had uh, 100 for Salahuddin, 100 for Ambar, 135 for Diala, and 25 for Kirkuk. Yet there was the problem that some of the governors failed to implement uh, that, except for one government. حاليا اهم البرامج اللي تعمل علينا وزاره الهجره والمهاجرين او بما يخص العائدين تحديدا يعني يتم استهدافهم العائدين الى مناطق سكنهم الاصليه في تثبيتهم بسلات غذائيه وسلات صحيه لمده السنه الاولى من عودتهم فقط كذلك يتم صرف منحه المليون مليون و500 تشجيعيه لدعم استقرارهم كذلك تنفيذ مشاريع 
صغيره مضره للدخل حسب الاستبيانات وحسب المستفيدين والنسبه الاكبر هي تذهب الى النساء المتضررات او الارامل او النساء اللي تملك اي عرق. كذلك عملنا تنسيق تنسيقي مع كثير من المنظمات الدوليه فيما يخص اعاده وتاهيل الدور السكنيه او صرفهم بمبالغ ماليه لاعاده او لاستئجار منازل اخرى الى ان يتم اعاده او اعمار منازلهم. هناك كثير من التحديات تعانيها وزاره الاجره والمهاجرين باعتبار انه اليوم يتم صرف مستحقاتها الماليه بسبب الازمه اللي يعاني منها العراق بصوره عامه ووزاره الهجره بصوره خاصه لكن حقيقه احنا نسعى مع كثير من المنظمات لدعم فئه عنايه الوزاره بالتالي اتصور اليوم انه المنظمه الدوليه لها هدفها انه يتم اغلق المخيمات والعوده الطوعيه للنازحين كذلك وزاره الهجره تعمل على نفس المبدا وهي الجهه القطاعيه المختصه بهذه الفئه فبالتالي احنا نستطيع نوجه اغلب المنظمات اللي موجوده في العراق لتعمل برؤيه واحده فبالتالي انه الاهداف والرؤيه هي يستفاد منها النازح العائد الى مناطق سكنها الاصليه. The most important programs of the Ministry of Immigration and Displacement is targeting these IDPs with the food baskets for the, for the first year, as well as the one million and a half Iraqi dinar, which is an allowance to encourage them to come back. Uh, this uh, also we have uh, opening small projects. Most of these small pro most of these micro projects were for uh, women in general and for widows and for. Uh, Handy handicapped woman. Uh, we also have uh, some coordination with some uh, international organizations to rehabilitate the housing units or even finding uh, rent, uh, rented units for the IDPs. Yet there is the fact that we are still facing so many challenges. The most the biggest one of which is the budget. But rest assured that we will work with all our capacity to close the camps and to participate and to encourage the voluntary return of the IDPs. And uh, we can also work with the um, humanitarian organizations to help guide them so that they can be enabled to look with one eye on all the projects that needs that need to be made. Right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister. Obviously, you have been uh, very, very active in a short amount of time since uh, you assumed your position. Uh, and uh, it is good to see all these activities and all your support. And I know uh, you have been uh, going to the field, to the different uh, provinces and to the different camps. Uh, so thank you uh, for sharing that. Uh, one question that is uh, on the mind of many people when it comes to displaced people is that how does the coronavirus uh, uh, poses a risk particularly to people in displaced camps? Uh, so can you tell us what is the situation of those camps uh, as it re uh, and those displaced people as it relates to the coronavirus and what steps your government has taken to protect uh, the displaced uh, populations? حقيقة يعني كوزارة هجرة مهجرين حتى يكون لنا يعني سيطرة كاملة على أغلب المخيمات اللي موجودة ولا يصابون بجائحة كورونا كان لنا اتفاق واتفاقية مع وزارة الصحة وكذلك وزارة الدفاع أن يتم تعفير وتعقيم أغلب المخيمات وبشكل دوري لغرض إجراء المتابعات الدولية من خلال الكوادر الصحية والتعاون مع وزارة الدفاع وخصصت لوزارة الهجرة مبالغ لوزارة الدفاع لتتولى 
هذا الامر كذلك حقيقه هناك كثير من المنظمات المحليه والفرق الشبابيه التطوعيه تعمل مع وزاره الهجره من خلال توزيع الكمامات توزيع البروشورات التوعويه كذلك حتى احنا نحافظ او نحد من انتشار الفيروس في المخيمات كان هناك اصابات في بعض المخيمات باعتبار انه في محافظه نينوى كان كان لدينا اصابه كانت من احد المنتسبين في الجيش العراقي قادم من محافظه بغداد لكن تم السيطره عليه كذلك في دهوك تم اصابه تقريبا ما يقارب 14 شخص في مخيم كانوا ملامسين ايضا لكن ايضا تم غلق المخيم وتم اجراء كافه الاجراءات الاحترازيه وتم حجر الاشخاص المصابين والملامسين ايضا والان لحد اللحظه يعني الوضع مسيطر عليه في داخل المخيمات. As a Ministry of uh, Immigration, we had an agreement and coordination with the Ministry of Health to uh, to sanitize all the camps periodically, and uh, a lot of coordination was done on that. We also uh, had uh, coordination with the Ministry of uh, Defense. We also had um, uh, for the same purpose. We we also had. Uh, youth teams who are uh, volunteers to uh, so, to uh, uh, circulate masks and uh, sanitizers among the inhabitants of the camps for the um, uh, cases there was one case in Nenua Nen and uh, 14 cases in uh, the hook uh, but uh, these people had been quarantined and all the people who were close to them were quarantined and the situation now is under control. Great, well, that's uh, welcome news. It's unfortunate that there were uh, some cases, but it's welcome news that uh, you have this situation under control because I know Iraq as a country is struggling with the spread of the coronavirus um, in many places. Um, so, uh, my other question to you, uh, Minister, is if, if I uh, take a step back and uh, get to where we started with Dr. Fouad Hussein earlier, you are here in Washington, uh, you have participated in the, uh, in the dialogues and you attended the meeting uh, with President Trump today. Uh, what do you hope as Minister to get from the dialogue here and from these meetings in Washington? What can you share with us? يعني حقيقة أنا كلش كنت سعيدة باللقاء وأتصور يعني هو كان جدا لقاء إيجابي ويوم بالنسبة لنا كان يوم سعيد جدا وننتظر نتائج إيجابية جدا بحيث أنه اليوم نحافظ على علاقاتنا مع جميع الدول بشكل متوازي جدا بما يخدم I was so happy today, today and with the, with the results of the visit and the dialogue, and we are waiting for uh, more positive results that will help sustain the relation, the relationship between the two countries in uh, in a better way. Can you please share with us in, in more specific ways, uh, in your meetings with different uh, U.S. government institutions, what is the help that you as a minister and the minister of uh, Ministry of Migration and Displacement, you need from the United States to help you with? حقيقة <تصفيق> الدولية وكذلك الحكومة المحلية فبالتالي راح تكون النتائج إيجابية أكثر وأكيد هي تخدم فئة عناية الوزارة لهذا السبب نأمل أنه بالمستقبل القريب أنه يكون التعامل مباشرة مع الوزارة فبالتالي الوزارة راح تسهل 
كثير من حركة المنظمات الدولية وأيضا توجه المنظمات الدولية بخطة العمل المشتركة أنه وين بالفعل اليوم نحتاج إلى دعم أي مخيم عودة أي مخيم موجود في العراق فبالتالي راح تكون النتائج أكثر إيجابية We need the we need support from USAID. We need support from uh, other uh, human organizations, and uh, to process their work as uh, as participative through an action plan between the the central government and the regional government and the uh, uh, human organizations. All that should uh, be able to uh, process their work and to expedite the, the logistic uh, details. Uh, we also hope that the, uh, after establishing these uh, steps that uh, any uh, human organization would deal directly with the Ministry of Immigration so that we can expedite the process of Of, of them implementing the job. Thank you. So staying with the um, help that uh, Iraq needs with the, from the international community, and if we can speak uh, uh, openly and transparently, I know uh, some of the issues that uh, 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 had occurred before you became minister, uh, you cannot speak uh, for those and for the previous governments. But when I meet in my meetings with the Iraqi officials, uh, there is always um, uh, complain or blame that the international community is is not uh, helping Iraq enough or not cooperating enough or not coordinating enough. But I, when I also meet uh, with uh, international organizations that try to help Iraq, they say the same thing, that the Iraqi government is not cooperating with them, is not coordinating, they do not have a, they do not share strategy. So how can, how can uh, you uh, as minister started uh, recently help overcome this challenge uh, and therefore it to be better coordination and cooperation uh, with international organizations trying to help uh, the displaced people to go home? Keep that, هناك مشاكل سابقة قبل تولية الوزارة عندما نسأل العراقيين عن دور المنظمات الدولية يشكون من أن المنظمات الدولية لا تقوم بالجهد الكافي لكن عندما نسأل تلك المنظمات يشكون من نفس الشيء وأن هناك خلل في التنسيق وتقديم الدعم لإنجاز الأعمال كيف يمكنك كوزيرة تجاوز تلك العقبة؟ حقيقة بالحكومات السابقة كانت واضحة هذا الشيء، كان هناك عمل عشوائي فيما يخص المنظمات الدولية اللي كانت موجودة وكذلك فيما يخص خطة عمل الوزارة نفسها، لهذا السبب حقيقة احنا ارتئينا ان نلتقي بكثير من المنظمات او الوكالات المعنية بالتنسيق مع المنظمات الدولية اللي موجودة اللي تعمل على خدمة فئة عناية الوزارة ان يكون هناك خطة عمل واحدة هي اللي معنية هذه خطة العمل وبالتشارك مع الوزارة هي اللي تعمل وتعنى بهذه الفئة فأتصور كانت أغلبية الاجتماعات اللي إحنا اجتمعناها كانت إيجابية جدا وأبسط الأمثلة اللي يعني أذكرها لحضراتكم كان لنا تعامل مع الآي أم مشترك بحيث إحنا ذللنا كل الصعوبات اللي تواجهها الآي أم بالمخيمات وأيضا سهلنا عمل حركتها قال المحافظة إلى أخرى وأيضا زودناها بداتا بيس كاملة بالأسماء أنه أي أشخاص بالفعل ذهب بالعودة فبالتالي كان لنا نتائج جدا إيجابية بفترة قصيرة جدا خلال شهر أو شهر ونص تمت إعادة ما يقارب 2000 شخص إلى مناطق سكان محافظة زيارة وفي الأنبار وحاليا لدينا أيضا إعادة كبيرة جدا من نينوى وكذلك من مخيمات الاقليم الى سنجار. هذه النتائج الايجابيه تاتي انه اكون خطه عمل واحد لكن في الوسط فبالتالي تكون تشاركيه بالرؤيه وبالعمل فلهذا السبب كان لها نتائج جيده وفاعله. نامل من باقي المنظمات انه تعمل مع وزاره الهجره ليتم يكون لها العون 
في خدمة فئة العناية وأكيد كوزارة هجرة المهاجرين لا نتدخل أبدا بسياسة المنظمة المانحة ولا بالأموال ولا في أي شيء مجرد نحن نسهل عملها وكذلك نوجهها بالمكان الصحيح للعمل I I I agree that uh, the uh, previous uh, uh, government work in this regard was kind of random, but now this ministry has an action plan. We had we met so many uh, institutions and organizations, and all that was to reach uh, a, a one action plan. The uh, simplest example of uh, this. Uh, effort is the uh, cooperation with the IO, IOM. We helped them overcome all the difficulties that they faced in working and in transitioning from one place to another inside Iraq. We also gave them a database and all this resulted in a good uh, ID, IDP uh, return from the camps. All that happened because of that one action plan that we came up with. And we hope that um, everybody would uh, cooperate with us on, the, on this basis. And we promise that we will not interfere in the uh, work policies, in the financial policies of this organization or that. Uh Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, in terms of um, if we move to uh, in, in your remarks and through the conversation, you directly and indirectly uh, provided a list of challenges uh, that uh, you face and that the uh, IDPs face in returning. There are security challenges, there are uh, process challenges, uh, there are uh, physical destruction challenges, there are uh, challenges related to the community and to the politics. And one difficult group uh, uh, that people always talk about um, is the people who are accused of uh, or are members of the ISIS, uh, um, uh, of the uh, so-called ISIS families. And Al Hol camp uh, in Syria is one of the biggest symbols of this challenge, uh, where there are. Uh, more than 30,000 Iraqis. So can we, I would like to focus this segment of our discussion about, uh, from your perspective, um, what, is the Iraqi, what, what is the Iraqi government doing uh, to uh, bring the Iraqis in Al Hol camp uh, back to Iraq? And, um, uh, and I have another question from, from the, the audience as well, which is about the camp uh, in Zumar, that if you are bringing these people back to Iraq and you take them to Ninoa, uh, close to the, the, the minorities that they have um, uh, suffered at the hand of ISIS, how will this be perceived uh, by, the, uh, by the victims? Yeah. هناك مشاكل عديدة لكن السؤال الرئيسي هو عن مخيم الهول ما هو رأي فيك وزير أبي يعني ما الذي يمكن للحكومة العراقية أن ماذا لو قامت الحكومة العراقية بإعادتهم إلى العراق هناك أيضا سؤال حول حول المخيم في زمار وإعادتهم إلى نينا فيما يخص مخيم الهول حقيقة في حال الجهات الأمنية المتمثلة في الوزارة الداخلية واستشارية مجلس الأمن والاستخبارات في حال انقضوا وتم تدقيق الأسماء في داخل مخيم المول اللي بالغ عددهم ما يقارب 31 ألف وخمسمائة مواطن ويتم تم إعادتهم بالفعل إلى العراق أكيد وزارة الهجرة هنا جديد سوف تتم يعني يتم استقبالهم وكذلك يتم إيوائهم وإغاثتهم حقيقة نحن نرتقي كوزارة هجرة المهجرين أن يتم إعادتهم إلى مخيم الجلعة في قيارة مناسب أكثر من يعني مخيم العملة باعتبار أنه موقع مخيم العملة في محافظة نينوى في زمار يعتبر أنه حقيقة يعني هو طريقة إنشاء هذا المخيم كانت خاطئة جدا صرف على المخيم ما يقارب خمس مليارات 
وحقيقه الوزير السابق لم يكن راضي على بناء هذا المخيم لكن حسب توجيه دوله الرئيس السابق وبايجاد مكان ملائم تم تشكيل لجنه اللي هي من لجنه الدفاع والعمليات المشتركه وتم اختيار هذا المخيم لكن لاقى لاقى رفض كبير من الايزيديين كذلك من عشائر الزمار كذلك من نواب الكرد وكذلك من نواب نينوى كذلك لاقى رفضا من محافظ نينوى لهذا السبب ارتئينا كوزاره هجره المهاجرين رفع كتاب رسمي الى دوله الرئيس الحالي وان يتم اغلاقه بشكل نهائي واعطاء لوزاره الدفاع انه يتم استغلاله من خلال وزاره الدفاع اما ما يخص ال 8000 امراه و طفل الراغبين بالعوده من مخيم النور اكيد اليوم الهجره المهجرين تستقبلهم بلا حابه صدف باعتبار ان من اضعف الفئات سواء كانت امراه او طفل وسيتم ايوائهم واغاثتهم واعاده دمجهم مره اخرى بعد ان يتم تدقيقهم الامني واعاده دمجهم الى مناطق سكنهم الاصلي. Uh, for uh, as for Mukhayyam um, Al Hol, uh, of course, this is a job uh, for the Ministry of Interior and the National Intelligence to uh, tackle and to uh, make uh, security clear clearance for all these uh, people in case of the of of. Uh, finishing the security clearance, the Ministry of Immigration is very much willing to uh, help them in that. Yet, the Ministry of Immigration does not agree on uh, relocating them to uh, Zumar camp. The Ministry of Immigration would prefer to relocate them to al Jara in Kiara town in Nineveh, not in Zumar, because the, the the way in which the Zumar camp was made was wrong from the beginning. Even the previous minister was not satisfied with this. Plus, the process of um, relocating them to Zumar had been rejected by the Yazidis and by the uh, Kurds and by uh, some uh, parties in Nineveh. So we... Uh, uh, we would prefer to uh, uh, relocate them to Al Jada camp, as I said, in Kiara, in Kiara town, southern Mosul. And um, this process can be done uh, through the help of the Ministry of uh, Defense. For the 8,000 people who are willing to uh, come back, most of them are women and are children. The ministry is very much willing to uh, uh, to uh, supervise their return and to reintegrate them in in, in society again after ag again, of course, after uh, finishing their after after they get their security clearance. Uh, thank you very much. So if I uh, take that uh, conversation a little bit further, you uh, touched uh, now in your answer and uh, in other areas about um, uh, the resistance from the community that obviously if you want to return people, not only, it's not only the, uh, the, the uh, institutions of the state, the security institutions that they have concerns, but the community also is rejecting or not accepting uh, a return either to IDP camps or to their communities. Can you speak more about how this problem could be overcome? What is the strategy of your ministry to deal with that barrier uh, of return when it comes to um, uh, when the community is not accepting? And I also have a question from the audience um, uh, uh, and speaks to another aspect. Uh, obviously, one aspect of the concern of the community and the people is their ideology. Uh, how do you, uh, as government, think about the problem of ideology uh, of these people and for them not to be involved in violence um, again? For those who have been involved, actually. <laughs> ترفضها المجتمعات المحلية كيف يمكن للوزارة أو ماذا يمكن للوزارة أن تقوم به 
لحل هذا الاشكال. السؤال الثاني هو مشكله الايديولوجيا للعائدين، كيف يمكن التحقق من ذلك او تجاوز ذلك؟ حقيقه يعني احنا من خلال استقطاب الى داخل مقيم اكيد سيكون هناك برامج يعني تاهيليه برامج تدعم او برامج حتى تكون للدعم النفسي باعتبار انه تواجدهم في المخيم هو ما يقارب ست سنوات فاكيد هناك سوف يكون تغيير كبير بالايديولوجيه اللي موجوده لدى هؤلاء النازحين لهذا السبب الوزاره تعمل مع كثير من المنظمات لدعمهم واعاده تاهيلهم وكذلك اعاده دمجهم في المجتمع من خلال برامج خاصه تعنى بالمصالح الوطنيه. In uh, case of their return, there will be programs to uh, tackle this uh, matter, uh, the ideology, and uh, you know these people have, especially the children, have stayed for five or six years in the camp. So there will be programs to uh, help uh, tackle and mitigate the effects of this. Well, um, thank you. I particularly uh, appreciated your comments uh, yesterday when we we, had, we discussed this matter about how you view, uh, it, you personally view that it is, uh, it, is, it is better to enable these people to return home uh, because when they are uh, integrated into the broader community, that is the better and the best way for them to not to be attracted to uh, those kind of ideologies. Uh, and that will be the best this engagement strategy uh, for them to integrate uh, with the broader community and have the community positive community effect um, uh, on them. Um, when we have a few minutes left, and uh, I have a couple of more questions that I would like to get to from the audience. One of them is um, basically, um, so what is the status uh, of IDP uh, returns um, uh, to uh, Christian communities in Ninoa? Uh, in general and with respect to uh, the community of Batnai in particular. I know you mentioned earlier that uh, about you think that about 70% uh, have returned of the Christians to those areas. But if you can, I know Batnai is a particular problem that comes up again, um, if you can speak to that. And uh, the broader question that I also have related to this is that how will the government of Iraq support uh, returns for the historic, historic homelands of Christians, Ezidis, and other minorities victimized by ISIS. حقيقة إذا نلاحظ كسهل نينوى تحديدا كنينوى أتصور اليوم عودة المسيحيين في داخل نينوى صعب باعتبار اليوم لدينا فقط ما يقارب 20 إلى 22 عائلة فقط في داخل نينوى عائدين لكن في سهل نينوى العودة أكثر وما يقال تقريبا 70% القضاء يعني قضاء حمداني وقضاء في بطنايا عندنا ما يقارب 100 عائله الان عائده بعد ان تم اعاده اعمار مناطقهم والبنى التحتيه كذلك تم ترميم منازلهم اذا كان بصوره جزئي او كلي انا على تواصل مع راعي ابرشيه المنطقة اللي هو الأب آرام حسب المعلومات الأخيرة هناك عودة كبيرة إلى بطنايا لكن جائحة كورونا أدت إلى عرقلة العودة لكن مع هذا أنا زلت منطقة بطنايا تقريبا أثناء زيارتي إلى الأقليم ولاحظت هناك العديد من العوائل العائدة تمارس حياتها الطبيعية بشكل طبيعي كثير من الشباب والشابات موجودين حاليا في بطنايا تم بناء تم تم بناء مركز لاستقطاب الشباب وممارسة الرياضة شاركت أنا نفسي يعني مع كثير من النشاطات التي يقومون بها في داخل بطنايا ألاحظ أنه حقيقة 
في المرحلة القادمة وبعد انتهاء جائحة كورونا أو أو حدة انتشارها وفتح الطرق من ناحية إقليم كردستان سيتم عودة الكثير من النازحين. أما ما يخص تركيا ف العائق الكبير اللي موجود في تركيا هو سجن الكسفيرات صراحة أنا تكلمت مع وزير الداخلية كذلك مع وزير العدل بما يخص سجن الكسفيرات وعدني وزير الداخلية أنه يتم يعني سحب كمرحلة أولية ألف سجين تدريجيا إلى أن يتم إفراغ السجن وغلقه وإعادته إلى وزارة الشباب والرياضة وإلى أن يتم هذا الشيء أصور عودة المسيحيين جدا صعب اعتبار هناك كثير من المعوقات أيضا من ضمن المعوقات اللي موجودة في تركيا هو وجود أربع محاكم كذلك الجنايات الأولى والثانية محكمة الإرهاب أيضا هذا كان معرقل كذلك التغيير الديموغرافي الموجود بالمنطقة ونزوح الكثير من العوائل من الساحل الايمن في المنطقه هذا أدى كان عائق ايضا بما يخص المسيحيين لعودتهم الى تركيا. تركيا حقيقه منذ السبق يعني منذ القدم انه يعني اهلها هاجروا يعني صراحه لكن بطنايا ان شاء الله سيتم عوده الكثير من النازحين في الايام القادمه. For the Nineveh plane, the uh, return of the Christians to Nineveh is uh, kind of difficult. So far, 20 to 30 families returned to the center of Nineveh. For uh, Hamdania and Telkev, uh, this for Hamdania and Telkev, and uh, for Batnaya, uh, right around 100 families uh, had uh, returned their houses. Uh, had been uh, reconstructed. I personally met with Patriarch Aram and we talked about uh, some issues and the difficulties. Uh, of course, the effect of COVID-19 had impacted that. Uh, when I visited Batnaya, I noticed that so many families have returned, uh, a sports center was built. And we hope that after uh, the wind of COVID-19 abates, more families would come. For Telkev, the major uh, problems are the, uh, there is a temporary uh, jail. The Ministry of Interior uh, pro promised me that he will gradually eliminate the number of prisoners until it is empty and that building would uh, be uh, returned to the, to the Ministry of Youth and S Sport. There are also four uh, courts that uh, kind of handicap the uh, return of the Christians. Uh, the one, one more thing is the demographic change in Tel, Tel Kif. And uh, so many uh, families from Western Mosul had uh, emigrated uh, due to the military oper operations to Telkev. Before that, a return is difficult, but we hope that we will overcome these difficulties. Well, Minister Jabro, uh, thank you so much. We have come to the end of our time. Uh, I really appreciate the time that you spend, the uh, very straightforward answers and uh, all the work that you do. Uh, I wish you the best of luck in uh, the remaining meetings here in Washington. Uh, I want to reiterate um, uh, uh, what our Vice President Mike Yaffe said at the beginning, that you, the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, will continue to support the Iraqi government and your ministry in uh, 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 with a difficult task at hand of uh, allowing and enabling uh, those uh, many people who are still displaced to go home. Um, uh, we, as you, as you know, on August 14th, uh, with support from USIP, there has been an agreement between the Shia Turkmen and the Sunni Turkmen in Tal Afar to return um, home, and we look forward to working with your ministry on the follow-up steps uh, related to that. Thank you so much to you. Thank you so much to Minister Hussein, and thank you to our audience who have stayed with us and those who will be watching uh, in the in the future. Thank you so much.
شكرا جدا سعيدة كذلك وأنا أتمنى أنه تبقى اليو اس اي بي دائما للعراق ودائما لفئة العناية بوزارة المجنة وكذلك دائما ما يخص الأقليات وخاصة سهلين وسجان ونتمنى أن تكون في الأيام القادمة عمل جديد مع وزارة الهجرة ووثيقة تفاهم جديدة لما يخدم فئة عناية الوزارة. For sure. Thank you so much. شكرا جزيلا.